So let's start um, just by quickly identifying our textbook. Greg Mann, QD's Macroeconomics. This is the most common macroeconomics textbook for at the intermediate level out there. It's the most popular. Um, you're going to need a copy of the book, whether that's a hard copy or some other kind of copy. I'm fine with that. I think there is a copy on reserve at the library. I'll go and check about that. Um, there are also older editions. I'm okay with that. Most of the principles are the same. Just find a friend who has the new edition and reference it to see where there are differences so that you can keep up the speed. Does that make sense? Another book that is helpful for this course is this modern macroeconomics course. This is a bookie book, right? It's just like lots of reading. This is not assigned. It's not required. Um, it's slightly recommended, okay? This is going to give you the history of economics, of how macroeconomics came to exist, and sort of what some of the conflicts have been in macroeconomics over the course of history. I'm going to make reference to this book throughout the semester uh, as I lecture. Um, but um, otherwise, it's, it's a really, really big book, and it's quite academic. A couple of things that I would pull out of here, just even right away, to think about macroeconomics in the big picture, as I was reading through this again. Oliver Blanchard, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, said macroeconomics is not an exact science, but an applied one where ideas, theories, and models are constantly evaluated against the facts and often modified or rejected. Macroeconomics is thus the result of a sustained process of construction of an interaction between ideas and events. What a macroeconomics, what macroeconomists believe today is the result of an evolutionary process in which they have eliminated those ideas that failed and kept those that appear to explain reality fairly well. Those of you who've ever done any kind of a study of the philosophy of science will know that, or if you've done any statistics courses, do you ever accept the hypothesis in a, in a test? No, the best we ever do is we fail to reject the null hypothesis, right? We can never actually prove something according to this philosophy of science. Instead, we can reject ideas that don't work very well. We can disprove things more than we can prove things. And the same is true for macroeconomics. There's a lot of theories. Most of them hold up pretty well, but no one theory explains everything. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff that we're trying to explain. And as a result, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of variables involved. And, and so no one single model really captures it all. People have tried, right? It just, typically it gets beyond human comprehension in order to make it that complicated, that exact. Since we can't be precise in explaining what's happening in the macro economy, what might be a, a fair trade-off is instead to identify something that is robust something that holds up under most circumstances, and if you get it wrong, it doesn't screw up everything. It doesn't blow the whole world up, right? The, the, the distinction between precision and robustness is helpful in trying to think about what kinds of theories we want to develop. A robust theory is, in many ways, safer, especially with respect to black swan type of events. Anybody ever hear the term black swan event? How often have you seen a black swan? Not very often, right? They're a rare occurrence, but they're a rare occurrence that can be catastrophic, like a pandemic, like a financial crisis, right? A black swan event is something that is hard to predict. Can we build systems, or at least recognize systems that are robust to black swan type of events? Would that be something that we would prefer to developing systems or identifying systems that are very, very precise. But if you get them wrong, totally catastrophic. It's a trade-off, isn't it? In economics, we say there are no solutions. 
There are only trade-offs. You can't have a perfect world. You can only move towards it slowly. Now, the study of macroeconomics then went through several cycles over time. Before the 1930s, there wasn't even a separate discipline called macroeconomics. There were people who studied capital and interest and large banking systems and money systems, right? And these kinds of structures, although GDP wasn't really a figure that had been invented or collected at that time. Unemployment was a concern, but they also, there weren't really statistical tools in place to capture unemployment. We might ask ourselves why. But with the Great Depression in the 1930s, People looked to economists who were a rising profession at the time. There hadn't been a separate profession called economists until the late 1800s. But then economists sort of injected themselves into all sorts of new positions in government that hadn't existed before. To give themselves an opportunity to try to influence policy, they thought for the better. It's always important when somebody says, I want to do something good to help people. You want to ask which people? There's no solutions, there's only trade offs. So, one of the first people to write extensively and to have a major impact on the way that we today think about macroeconomics was this fellow John Maynard Keynes. You guys familiar with the name? You heard John Maynard Keynes in your intro course? And Keynes developed what he called the general theory. We're going to look at a lot of Keynesian concepts because it was out of his early work that the rest of macroeconomics was sort of developed. It was in response, oftentimes, to Keynes. Among those who were responding to Keynes were some who had been influential before Keynes, like Ludwig von Mises and, and Friedrich von Hayek. Some people have identified uh, an adversarial competition for ideas between Hayek and, and Keynes that persisted throughout the 1900s and even to today. Some people even made a rap video about it. How many of you have seen the Keynes Hayek rap video? Have you seen this video? You might want to, oh, maybe I'll post a link. Okay. The competition for influence over policy and theory is really a part of why macroeconomics is studied so intensively and people say pay so much attention to it today. Another important figure emerged after the Keynes-Hayek debate, but still engaged particularly more with, with Keynes than with Hayek was a fellow named Milton Friedman. Anybody ever hear of Milton Friedman? Before, okay, yeah, we call him Uncle Milton, right? Uncle Milton said one thing that we typically remember very carefully. What, what, what's the main thing you remember that Uncle Milton maybe said? Yes? There's no free lunch. Okay, he did say there's no free lunch. That's also true, right? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch and staffle. Any other favorite Milton Friedman quotes? How about MV equals PQ? Remember that one? About the, the monetary theory? Any other Milton Friedman? My favorite one is from Milton Friedman is. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Does that ring a bell? Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. We'll talk about that more in the future. Friedman said regarding what are the goals of economic policy, he said there's wide agreement about the major goals of economic policy. We want high employment, stable prices, and rapid growth. There is less agreement that these goals are mutually compatible, or among those who regard them as incompatible about the terms at which they can and should be substituted for one another. There is at least, there is least agreement about the role that various instruments of policy can and should play in achieving 
the several goals. Now, what did he say here? What particular issues did he identify? He said, high employment, Stable prices, and growth. Which is most important? I think it's best to focus on stable prices, don't you? That's a normative statement, isn't it? A normative statement saying one thing is better than another. It's imposing a value judgment on something. We want to be careful throughout the course to maintain the distinction between positive and normative statements. Positive statements identify the causal relations amongst different factors, the trade-offs involved. They're they're not they don't carry a lot of normative content or moralistic kind of content. They're not subject to differences in preferences. Right? Positive statements just simply are, are the thing that we can be called the most scientific. They are falsifiable, right? Falsifiable. Freeman says, okay, most economists agree that these ought to be the goals of macroeconomic policy. What about equality? Or distribution of wealth? Is that something that we typically want in the world? Is equality a good thing? Is growth a good thing? It depends. You decide. Right? These are all normative values. If we try to achieve equality, we're going to have to give something else up, though. Or we might have to, anyway. We might give up growth. Or we might have to give up high unemployment or high employment. There's no solutions, there's only trade offs. Right? No solutions, only trade offs. So then, amongst these various policy goals, equality is not something that most economists agree about. That tends to be more outside the scope of what is treated as mainstream economic policy. Although today, there's a lot of talk about trying to achieve greater levels of equality, isn't there? Okay. So suppose most economists agree that these are good goals. Does that matter? Who cares whether economists agree? Does that mean that's what we should do? Economists are not those who are supposed to put into place particular policies at the government level, choosing the goals that they think are the most important. How do we decide what goals are most important in a democracy? People vote on it. How good does that work? <laughs> right? We've got problems with voting, don't we? We've got problems with voting. It seems to have played out this last time around. I don't know. Right? I'm not going to make a judgment about it because I don't vote. Oh, that's going to make some people laugh. Voting is the least expensive way that you can participate in a democracy. It's also the least effective way of participating in democracy. You have a very weak ability to identify to those who are making political decisions for all of us what your actual preferences are by casting a vote. A couple of weeks ago, I had a letter to the editor published in the Muncie Star. You see, they want to build a new YMCA at Tui Park. You guys hear about this? We're trying to build a new YMCA at Tui Park. A bunch of people are very upset about this. I don't care. However, in my letter to the editor, I identified the fact that most of the arguments that people were making regarding whether the new IMCA should be built at Tui Park or not at Tui Park were horrible arguments. And they hated that even more. And they really didn't like the fact that I was just saying, you might be right, but what you said doesn't prove it. 
the economist's job is to say, right, the things that you think you can do, you, you probably can't do it. You know, you think you can do these things, Nemo, but you just can't. Why don't you touch the button? How do we then identify our policy goals in a democracy? What's the process for doing that? Some people think of democracy as politics by voting. What if instead we think about democracy as governance through discussion? Through discussion. In that case, writing a letter to the editor is worth 100 votes, if not more, because I've enriched the conversation about the policy issue, switching it from a binary yes or no to, well, let's think about. What happens in a democracy if people stop talking to each other? Does it matter if we maintain good voting procedures? If people can't talk to each other? If people are not talking in a way that respects other people? Then we have to start worrying about whether democracy can be sustained at all. The voting is just the artifact, the conversation is a process whereby we come to some sort of a consensus that we can then vote about. It's just like markets. You go, to the, you go out and try to buy something. Okay? You wanna buy a used car. You see one standing on the side of the road, it's a used car, the sticker in it says for sale. You don't know it because there's no price on the car, but the person who's selling the car is willing to sell it for $10,000. Now you look at the car and you don't know what the seller is trying to sell it for. And you look at it and you think about it, look at the mileage on it, what kind of shape it's in. And you say, you know what? I'd be willing to spend $16,000 on that car. What's the right price? What's the right price for the car? Yes. 16,000, why? Because that's what the buyer values it at. That's what the buyer values it at, okay. What about 13,000? If it were 13,000, would the exchange take place? Yes, okay. How much surplus is generated if we sell the car at $16,000? $6,000 worth of surplus, all captured by the seller. If we sell for $13,000, the buyer captures $3,000 of surplus and the seller gets $3,000 worth of surplus. Total surplus again, $6,000, the same. Do we care who gets most of the surplus? Not really. Not as economists anyway. As economists, we don't really care. And in the real world, who captures most of the surplus in most exchange relationships? Is it the sellers that usually get most of the surplus or the buyers that get most of the surplus? What do you think? Sellers get most of the surplus. What do you think? The sellers. Yes. I'm going to say the buyers. I'm going to say the buyer. Okay. Now, I usually just do this in my intro course, but it's worth doing again here. Right? So, you have a smartphone there? Yes. Okay, what smartphone is that? An iPhone. You guys remember the Motorola Razor? flip phone, right? Some of you have heard this story. It's okay to hear it again, I hope. How much did those smart, those flip phones sell for when they were brand new on the market? First time they sold one of those flip phones, $600. That flip phone sold for $600. Now, what if I were to tell you, I'll give you a Motorola Razor and you give me your smartphone and you never get to have a smartphone again. How much would I have to pay you to make you willing to engage in that transaction? How much would I have to pay you to give up smartphones forever? Would you do it for $1,000? No. Would you do it for $5,000? Probably not. Let's say you do it for $7,000. Still probably not in most cases, but let's just say for the sake of the argument, you would. 
What do you call all this? The fact that you can buy a used smartphone for $600, but it's worth over $7,000 to you. What do you call that? That's surplus. That's surplus, isn't it? In almost every exchange relationship that you engage in, the buyer captures the majority of the surplus. The seller gets money, but you're getting value, value way above what you actually have to pay for it. Sellers are competing with one another, so their surpluses are really tight. Their margins are small, aren't they? Unless maybe they're a monopolist. But even Apple has to compete. Even they are constrained to only selling their phones for $1,000 when people would be willing to pay $7,000 for them. Are you with me? They have to compete because there's other phone manufacturers. Like OnePlus. You guys know what OnePlus? I didn't know about it five years ago. You mean there's new entry into this market? There's continuing competition? Yeah. There's ongoing competition. Maybe we'll someday be able to buy a Huawei again. They're the best phone bar, the Huawei. Okay. Consumers capture the majority of the surplus. How do we decide what goals we're going to aim at in our economic policy? There has to be a robust conversation about this. And economists actually do a fairly good job at maintaining that conversation. In this class, we want to maintain a robust conversation as well. How can we do that? We have to have a set of rules. A set of rules that we will all abide by and that we all agree to abide by, and that's our syllabus. So on the syllabus, I've given you the opportunity to make amendments to the syllabus. You can exercise voice. You can be a part of the conversation that determines what the rules are for our course. If you think that something should be amended in the syllabus, make a suggestion. If you like it just like it is, say you approve. I'm actually thinking of instead of having four bigger homework assignments through the semester, having 10 small, something like that. Okay. A little bit more frequent feedback for you guys. I don't know. You guys think about that and tell me what you think. So Freeman says, okay, most economists tend to agree about this. And it's probably true also that most of the people in society also would agree at these goals as being the primary goals. What we don't agree about is necessarily how much we're willing to give up in terms of stable prices in order to improve employment, or whether we're willing to give up some stability in prices to increase economic growth, right? That's sort of the price ratio of these alternatives. We don't all agree about what our willingness to pay what the opportunity cost would be to us of giving up some of this in order to get more of that. And even less in agreement is, well, what institutions do we want to use and what policies put in place, enforced and enacted by those institutions do we approve of for causing the shifts in priority amongst these goals? How do we want to achieve these ends? And how much power do we want to give an institution? This is what economists agree the least about. Economists disagree about lots of things. Economists disagree about things that are related to preferences or normative value judgments. Economists shouldn't really be opining or imposing those anyhow. Macroeconomics looks at the market that emerges through all of our private individual exchange relationships that are repeated again and again and again to the point where we sort of take them for granted. And it says, given, given this set of exchange relationships that already exists, are we happy with them the way that they are? Or do we want to try to influence those exchange relationships 
in any way. Do we want to constrain what kinds of exchanges are allowed? Do we want to subsidize some exchanges? Do we want to tax some exchanges? And do we want to do those in a way that can affect the larger policy goals? Before Keynes, it was widely believed that if you leave markets alone, they will self-correct. If things go out of equilibrium for a while, markets will self-correct and bring things back into equilibrium. Keynes challenged that and said, it's possible that a market can be pushed out of equilibrium and get stuck in a bad situation, like the Great Depression. And his concern was, if we end up in a situation where markets are out of equilibrium and can't get back into equilibrium, is there anything that we can do at the government level, or maybe not necessarily at the government level, maybe at the level of the banks, or maybe not necessarily at the level of the banks, maybe at some lower level of institution. Is there anything that an institution can do to change the rules of the game so that we can move back to a situation where things are in equilibrium. What does it mean for things to be out of equilibrium? Well, the economic growth rate could fall below what is normally sustainable. There is a sustainable path of growth. If you try to go too fast, it could mean that in the future, you slow down again. What does it mean for there to be something sustainable with stable prices. If you have inflation in the short run, it might mean that you have to have deflation later on. These fluctuations can occur. Keynes recommended a bunch of different kinds of actions that governments can do in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of spending more money or cutting taxes that could help boosting the economy out of a recession. I have said, you don't know what you're doing, Keynes. Matter of fact, you can't know what you're doing. He made a very strong epistemological kind of argument about what we can know and what we can't know. If you've had intermediate microeconomics, you should have read The Use of Knowledge in Society by Jeffrey Hyde. That's where he makes this epistemological argument. How can you know what we know? Kind of argument. Bill and Freeman came along later and said, Keynes, the system that you put together, the, the way the, the prescriptions that you put in place for ways that the government can respond to a recession have problems. There's problems with your model. As a matter of fact, some of the problems are so bad that they cause the exact opposite of your goal to actually obtain after imposing your policy prescription. So he, he was working within Keynes's model and sort of imploding it from the inside. Others have come along since to talk about ways to help achieve stability, growth, low unemployment, Okay, and I just covered this material. I'll do that sometimes. Later on, uh, a couple of economists, Richard Wagner and James Buchanan, I was on a call yesterday with Richard Wagner, came along and, and said, it's not just that the policy proposals that Keynes recommended and some of his followers have recommended don't actually achieve the goals that they wanted to achieve. It's also the fact that politicians or the people who enforce and put in place a particular policy often have an incentive to put it in place in a way that benefits them more than a way that benefits the overall economy in the long run. In other words, Keynes's idea that you should spend when you're in a recession and then save when you're in an expansion no politician ever has an incentive to 
to save during an expansion? Right? How would the government save during an expansionary period? They would increase taxes. What kind of a politician gets reelected by raising taxes? It doesn't happen, does it? Not typically. It would take a very populist kind of movement to actually accomplish. Why down today? I was looking at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, let's see, is this today's paper? This was the 15th. John Coogan and John Taylor have an article called um, the, the $2,000 stimulus checks won't boost the economy. You guys have heard about these checks? You guys get some money in the mail? They're nice. Some of you did, some of you didn't. Some of you are in that limbo place where like, I'm old enough, but I've never had a job. So I didn't get any money. What the heck, right? I'm in a position where like, I don't really need it, but thanks. For all those people who didn't really need it, but got stimulus, what do they do with it? Yeah. A lot of gun with it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. A gun is a good, uh, a good long-term asset. It typically does not go down in value. I've got a buddy of mine who owns a lot of guns because all of his business is in cash. What is another what is another thing that people do though? Yes. Home improvements. Home improvements. Again, that's also sort of a piggy bank maneuver, isn't it? Like you're going to improve your home so that it has a higher resale value. But well, most people did with the money is they saved it, either in the form of savings in the bank or in the form of a gun or in the form of home improvements, right? Some people went on vacation. I just got back from California. Flew back on Saturday. I was walking on the beach Saturday. It was 85 degrees. There were seals swimming around Laguna Bay while I was walking along there. There were flowers blooming all around. And I voluntarily, intentionally, got on a plane and came back here because I was so looking forward to seeing it. This article claims that the checks won't boost the economy. Boost the economy. Is the economy in a slump? Are we in a recession? What kind of a recession? It's hard to say. We're gonna look at it later, but it has both aggregate demand kinds of indicators and long-run aggregate supply kinds of indicators. The authors are John Coogan and John Taylor. John Taylor invented something called the Taylor Rule. The Taylor Rule is a set of prescriptions for how the Federal Reserve ought to increase the quantity supply of money over the long run based upon on major indicators that we can observe in the marketplace. This guy, today, or a couple of days ago, in the Wall Street Journal, you'll find him in your textbook. A big portion of the section on the Federal Reserve policies. These guys are still writing today and still influencing policy today. Wall Street Journal, 20th. Janet Yellen's debt burden, 21.6 trillion and growing. Who's Janet Yellen? And why is she yelling? Yes. She's the chairman of the Federal Reserve. She was. Or she was. Who's she now? And the Treasury Department. Is there a conflict of interest there? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Because the Fed is supposed to be independent. But if people who were under yelling at the Fed are loyal to her, and now she's at the Treasury, the Treasury is not independent of the government. It's actually a political appointment, isn't it? She's a member of the cabinet. There could be a conflict of interest. Of course, anybody who watched The Big Short, which I do recommend, right, will know that people leave major banks and go to the SEC, and then leave the SEC and go to Treasury, and then leave Treasury and go to the Fed, and then go back to the big banks. It's like a revolving set of doors. Why? Because then those people all know each other. They share sympathy, right? They're pals. They golf together on the weekends, right? They go to a kid, their kids' birthday parties. They go on, they go on cruises together. All right. So, so there's a there's an article in today's Wall Street Journal about Janet Yellen, and the question is, how much debt is too much debt? It's an interesting question. Before the Great Depression, the policy typically was, yes, we can go into debt if there's a war, but as soon as possible, we want to get back out of debt. 
since the Great Depression and since Keynesian policy became commonplace, there's almost always been debt. Not only has it been debt, there's almost always been an increasing deficit, which is an increase in the amount of borrowing relative to the amount of income year over year. During Clinton's years, that was relaxed a little bit. Mrs. Ye when Mrs. Yellen served in the Clinton administration as chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, you mean she's had another political appointment before she went to the Fed and now she's at the Treasury? Okay, talk about revolving doors. Now look, Jenny Yellen's a fantastic economist. Did some excellent work, okay? I'm not criticizing her. I'm saying maybe there's something wrong with the structure, with the system, right? When we, when we are concerned about problems within society, we don't always want to look at an individual and the way that they behave. We want to ask, are there structures within society that generate incentives for people to behave in a certain way? And that's also true when it comes to the Fed. <clears throat> Wall Street Journal. Janet Yellen calls virus aid crucial to economic recovery. Well, now she's weighing in on fiscal policy. Right? She's weighing in on policy that is done by Congress. She's an accountant in the Treasury. She's telling Congress what they should do, that they should give out the money to help come out of the recession. But John Taylor, a couple of minutes ago, was saying, the stimulus isn't going to help. I thought economists were mostly in agreement about the goals, yes, but in terms of what institutions to use and what policies to use to try to achieve those goals, no. Major disagreement, you can see it within three days in the most important financial newspaper in the United States. All people who have high credentials, I think Taylor won the Nobel Prize as well. Wall Street Journal. Today, Biden's stimulus hits all the right notes by Alan Blinder. I'm going to have you read an article later on in the semester by Alan Blinder, another economist who's still writing in the newspapers today, who is directly related to the curriculum that I created and others have created for this course five or 10 years ago. Wish some of these guys would make room for me, but not before their time. I will, um, I'll leave it at that for today. Are there questions for me about what we're doing here? It seems like it might be a good idea to read the Wall Street Journal. Might not be a bad idea. I think you can get a discounted subscription, um, but it might be worthwhile. Question. I can't remember on your syllabus. You said there were several group projects in here or is it mostly individual homework? I think all the projects are individual. Yeah, good question. Near the end of the semester, I have on the syllabus a book review, um, and you can choose which book to read, but I have to approve it. And I will provide a list of potential books if it's not already posted, um, although I might want to amend that some. I'd like to get some different books from what students read last semester, because after all, if I read your book review, then that means I don't have to read the book, um, or at least I don't have to read the book again. Uh, in terms of big picture stuff, there are two papers uh, on the syllabus for this week. One's by me. It's about poverty in the United States. I was commissioned to write that work. Um, I had a former student help me write it, his name is Benjamin Pettis. Uh, and, and we were commissioned to put that together. Make sure you read that and, and instill those ideas from it. Uh, you probably should get through chapter one of MANQ this week and get ahead on chapter two so that you're understanding where we're going next week. Other than that, I don't think I have anything else ready to talk about right now. I could sit here and read one of these journal articles, but you can read them on your own. Yes. Are you going to do uh, Zoom whenever you get that set up? Like for I might be or doing or it right now. Oh, okay. I don't know. Are you there? I don't know. <laughs> if it worked, hopefully it worked because that's the only recording I have of what I did today. Um, so hopefully it worked. And uh, and if and if I did that, if it worked, 
I will also post the video from class today to Canvas or a link to it from, uh, I'll, I'll post it to YouTube and I'll create a link. Now you can see all the videos I recorded last semester on YouTube. You guys saw that? Okay. So that means that I'm not sure how I'm going to do it because if I think that one of those videos is really good, then I won't redo it. But instead, what we'll do is we'll use class time to answer questions, to have a discussion, to work through some problems so that you're more well prepared for the homeworks and the exams. That would be my goal. The only other thing that I would ask you to pay attention to is the page that says professionality, right? About being professional. I'd really like for all work that you turn in to be business school quality work. I think you can do it. It's going to take a little extra effort, but it's good practice for you. And uh, some of this work will actually um, put you in a good position to, to have something in your portfolio to show a potential employer. Like, here's what I actually had to do and I did it. Work product like that speaks volumes more than just the credential. So that's important. Uh, to that end, there's also like a link to how to draw graphs on PowerPoint. I actually had students for one of my classes last semester drawing graphs on PowerPoint. By opening PowerPoint, they were using their mouse to draw lines. It was horrible. It was very, very bad. You can draw pretty graphs. You really can. Also become familiar with using equations to write math on, on Word because there's going to be a lot of algebra involved. So you have to work through algebra to create equations writing math using the equations tool or some other way on Word will make it much more readable and professional. Thank you all. I'll see you next Wednesday.